from 94 until 99 when I was working here, I worked here as a lab tech for a while and then as a gear designer thereafter. And I spent a lot of time in the combustion lab testing uh, stoves and modifying stoves. And I, I think my first stove design project was redesigning the um, burner target for the XTK. So I kind of started to learn about combustion back then. I was also working on a whole bunch of water purifier and water filtration projects as well. Uh, but uh, while I was in school and then also testing here at the lab, I got a background in combustion. And, and that actually led me, as I went into the fuel cell industry, I worked on hydrogen fuel processors, which have a number of combustion process and heat exchange processes. And that was from 99 until 2003. Um, and then when I got back out of that and uh, fell back in love with working in the outdoor industry, uh, I took a lot of the, the knowledge I had gained working on pretty scientific, high-tech, high-efficiency um, heat exchanger systems and, and combustion systems and applied that to the, um, to the reactor stove. Why do we do 100% primary air? Um, I was trying to develop a high efficiency stove to reduce the amount of fuel that people had to haul in the backcountry. And, um, you know, for obvious reasons, if you can, you know, make the efficiency of the stove um, improve, you just bring less fuel. And I think the standard, standard stoves were running around 40% efficiency. And we thought, well, gosh, what if we could do 80% efficiency? You know, basically reduce the fuel that you have to bring in half. And, and it'd be a huge thing for, for backcountry expeditions, especially where you're melting snow. So having this background in heat exchangers and combustion systems from hydrogen fuel cells, I started playing around with different thin configurations and heat exchangers that could be built into the bottom of pots. And I think at the time we were calling it, the, the research project was called Firepot, uh, which was the idea was having, you know, the combustion system built into the pot for, for high efficiency, um, for, to have a really high efficiency system. I also built, built a math model that tracked um, all of the combustion species and the heat exchanger efficiency through the system. And one of the things I found when I was started tweaking the parameters of that math model was that as I reduced excess air in the system, the, heat, the efficiency went way up. And the reason that happens is excess air basically dilutes the combustion gases and cools them down. And so it's uh, combustion heat transfer, or heat transfer efficiency is driven by the temperature of the combustion gases and the temperature of the pot. And so the, the hotter the gases are, the higher the efficiency is. The heat exchanger is really about having good conduction paths into the water and having a lot of surface area to transfer the heat from those hot combustion gases into, uh, into the water, into the pot. So this heat exchanger uh, is laser welded. The combustion gases go in through here and then they come out these ports around the side. And so you have all the thin area that's picking up heat. You've got the, the normal bottom of the pot that's picking up heat and the side of the pot. And then you have the heat exchanger cover which is also picking up heat from the inside. And so it's, you know, double the surface area of the pot right there, plus the fins. Uh, so um, lots of surfaces to pick up heat and then good conduction paths. So the pressure regulator is uh, basically allows us to bring the operating pressure way down uh, so that variability in the fuel canister doesn't affect the performance of the stove. Um, and we did that for two reasons. One was so that we could have optimal performance in most conditions, but then the other piece of it was so that we could uh, have the parameters in which the burner had to operate in be tighter. And, and you know, we didn't, if the fuel canister is on a hot day, it's 100 degrees out, the pressure can be you know, upwards of 70 PSI. And up in the mountains, it might be 5 PSI. And so we wanted, we brought it down to a pretty low pressure and then optimized around that. So that was one of the big hurdles was, how do you build a really compact, uh, reliable pressure regulator into a stove um, to obtain these, character these uh, operating characteristics that we were looking for? 
Yeah, what, what sets the reactor apart from a performance standpoint is its high efficiency. And there's other, other stoves out there that will now, with heat exchangers that are, are near the efficiency of a reactor, but only in laboratory environments. And because the reactor is 100% primary air, uh, and there's a tight coupling between the stove and the pot, wind is really a non-issue. I mean, it, it, the performance in, in really strong wind is, is almost unrecognizably different than it is without any wind at all. The only, the only difference is that you have some cooling of the pot on the outside, but the combustion gases aren't getting diluted by that wind like they are in every other stove out there. And then number two is that it has a lot of output. It's, it, you know, it, it's cranking. So when, you know, you have to, you know, make your water by boiling or uh, melting snow, it's, it's a lot of work to melt all that snow. And sometimes you have a big expedition and a lot of water to make. And, and this is faster than anything else out there for melting snow. Nobody wanted to produce a product that would then fail in the backcountry because uh, MSR's heritage was testing all the way back to, you know, ice axes and climbing helmets. And so I would say this combination of people having ideas that they wanted to see out there in the world and having to fight for those ideas to, to get prioritized, uh, and then which, you know, created a bit of a competitive culture, especially in the product development realms. But then also knowing that what you fought to have developed or to get to develop also had to be tested and rugged and, and really test the, um, you know, work over a long period of time. So that, that, that drove the culture was this, you can't be an armchair designer, you have to go out there and live it uh, and make sure it works in all those different environments. I think there's this spark that, that some people have to try and do something that hasn't been done, despite, you know, a lot of friction. And, you know, that's kind of the way the world works, is that if you do the thing that has been done before, or sort of follow in the footsteps that have, that have already been placed, then, you know, it's, life is going to be lower friction, but you're also not going to necessarily get to do, to develop something or invent something that's, that's crazy new.